Hello and welcome. So my name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. And I would just want to give a shout out to anybody who was at DGIQ last week in San Diego at our conference. I got to meet so many of y'all face-to-face, in person, and it was so nice to meet so much of the webinar community uh, in person. It was a great time, so I hope you can join us in the future if you weren't there last week. And we'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today, Bob will discuss gaining leadership support for data governance, sponsored today by Precisely. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, and we encourage you to share highlights via your favorite social media platform using hashtag RWDG. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you may click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Matt for a brief word from our sponsor, Precisely. Matt, hello and welcome. Thank you very much. So, welcome everybody. I'm very happy to be with you to talk a little bit about finding business value in data governance. And it's, it's a topic near and dear to our heart because we do a lot of business cases, justification, you know, value, size of the price type initiatives because the point of governance really is not governance. The point is to deliver a business outcome and those business outcomes that connect you know, the goals with the objectives are enabled by doing data governance initiatives. <clears throat> Executives and management, they don't really care about governance, they care about the problem you're solving. So the easiest way to talk about, you know, what's the size of the prize and is to talk about, this is the problem I'm solving, this is the outcome we're going to give you. Whether that is, you know, a business objective of quicker new product introduction, certain KPIs are getting better, we're going to make processes smoother, we're going to make our organization more streamlined, or we're going to provide better data for analytics. The point is that outcome, not the governance initiatives that we're talking about. And we can do that at three different levels. You can do it at the, str the strategic level, where you're really talking about transforming the business, where they're talking about, you know, compliance and privacy and pr protection, strategic programs with digital transformation and big data and things of that nature. Or you can go to the operation where you're growing the business. Like I talked earlier about new product introduction and saying for every day I shorten that process to get a product out to market, I get X number of dollars of revenue, additional revenue for that product. That's a very easy way to make a business case to do new product introduction initiatives. Or right at the tactical level for the more tactically focused management level, how am I getting data faster, better, more accurate to the places that need it? Okay. Lastly, where are we? We're a leader in data integrity. Data management from initiation, change, movement to visibility, observability, data quality is all what we do. Truckload of customers, many of the Fortune 100, we exist all over the world and we're not small anymore. We used to be small, we're not anymore. We're over 2,500 people in our, in our group. My individual group deals with strategic services. We're the management consulting arm for Precisely. And from everything from a program perspective, we get involved in with some of the largest companies in the world. Whether it's you setting out the data strategy, figuring out what the organization needs to look like, how some of your processes are going to work from an operational standpoint. And what we're going to talk about today from Bob, how do you realize the value? How do you explain to 
your leaders, this is what you're going to deliver and by when. Looking forward to hearing everything that's gonna come from the next 55 minutes or so. Wanna learn more about us? I'll leave this up, feel free to click on it and make some contacts. With that, Shannon, I will turn it back to you. Matt, thank you so much for joining us in this quick, very good presentation. If you have questions for Matt or about uh, precisely, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion as he will be joining us in the Q&A portion of the uh, presentation at the end of the webinar today. And thanks to Precisely for sponsoring today's webinar to help make these webinars happen. And now let me introduce the speaker for the series, Bob Siner. Uh, Bob is, I should be able to know this by heart, Bob, don't you know, is the president and principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the data administration newsletter, tdn.com. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and the data management solutions. And with that, I'll give the floor to Bob to start his presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? It's good. Thanks, good. Yeah, you sound good. Okay, very good. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, boy, this is really perfectly aligned. The things you talk about perfectly align with the uh, what I'm going to talk about today: finding business value. Um, it's it is the thing that people that you were saying, as I think I quoted you here and I wrote it down. Management cares about the problem that you're solving, right? If we're going to gain their support, um, they need to understand that the problems aren't going to solve themselves. So making certain that you have their support and their sponsorship and their understanding of data governance is going to be critical to your success. So thank you again, Matt. Appreciate your being here. I um, also wanted to mention something that Shannon had mentioned in the introduction. Um, it, it was amazing how many people came up to me at the conference in San Diego last week, just recognizing my voice from the webinars. And I know, Shannon, that happens to you quite a bit as well. But it was good to see people from the uh, from the data diversity community at the DGIQ West conference last week. I hope to see you at the East conference in December um, coming up this year. It's always great. This community is, is fantastic. So happy to be here. Today, we have a really important topic. And in fact, it, it, it's interesting because I know with the data diversity community, we have a mix of people who are already well down their path of establishing uh, their data governance program. And then we still have some people that are, that this is relatively new to, and that they're still in the, the phase of, of gaining leadership support for data governance. The truth is that even those companies that are, are down the road quite a bit, um, they're still actively, uh, continuously looking to gain leadership support because as one of the things that I'll talk about during the webinar today, as a best practice for standing up a data governance program, if you don't have senior leadership support, sponsorship, and understanding of your program, your program is going to be at risk. Some some other shiny object, some other sexy data governance, uh, data management, data oriented uh, project will come along and we'll steal the thunder or, or we'll take people's eyes away from data governance. So we know that we're gonna need to continuously gain leadership support. If we have it, then we gotta be fighting to keep it because there's a lot of other people, a lot of other topics that are, are vying for the interest of our leadership. So before I get started today, I just wanted to share a couple of things that I'm involved in. You may know of some of these things. Um, you know about the monthly webinar series, obviously. Next month, I'm going to be talking about how to govern glossaries, dictionaries, and data catalogs. That's also a, a subject of an online learning plan that's available through the Data Diversity Training Center that I did. Um, I also will be speaking at some upcoming events, including the Enterprise Data World event in Anaheim in September. Um, you may be familiar with the book that I wrote several years ago called Non-Invasive Data Governance. Um, the, the new news is that last month, my second book came out. It's Non-Invasive Data Governance Strikes Again. It's basically lessons learned, perspective gained since, since I have been using that approach, the non-invasive approach to implement governance. I mentioned a couple of learning, online learning plans, non-invasive data governance, metadata governance, and the glossaries, dictionaries, and catalogs learning plan. My consulting business is KIK Consulting and Educational Services. 
You may be familiar with the data administration newsletter. In my spare time, if it looks like I really have any spare time, I'm also an adjunct faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in their chief data officer program. Um, today, I want to talk about this specific subject. I, I really think it's important to understand why do we need leadership support? Um, what's, the, what's the problem? How are we going to gain leadership support? How do we bottle all of the challenges and the things that people in the organization are having with data and help leadership to understand that some of those things just are never going to change unless somebody has the responsibility for, for implementing formal governance across the organization. So I'm going to start with best practices because there needs to be a best practice associated with gaining senior leadership support, not only support, but sponsorship and understanding as well. I'll talk about that more in a minute. We'll talk about how defining what leadership needs from data governance is an important aspect of speaking their language, getting them to understand that the problems that are being solved by data governance are the things that they care most about. So I'm going to share with you several categories of things that we can focus on to define what leadership needs from data governance. We'll talk about techniques to record some of those business data challenges that people have that your leadership may or may not know about, but ways to record information to size up your existing data landscape so that they understand that there are issues and challenges that need to be addressed. And then using the challenges as a way to gain support from your leadership and then finally, we'll talk about policy and strategy to gain leadership support. So as I do with all of the webinars in this series, I, I basically, I start with a, a series of definitions. And, and again, I'm just trying to get on the same page as we get started. Um, I word my definition of data governance very strongly. I say that data governance is the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data and data-related assets. 95% of my clients do not select this as their definition because they feel it's worded too strongly. The truth is at the end of the day, no matter what approach you take to data governance, you need to execute and enforce authority over the data. If people are gonna follow quality standards, if they're gonna follow compliance rules, if they're going to do things that are going to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of use of data within the organization, it's going to require that you execute and enforce authority over the data. If everybody's left to do what they want to do with no rhyme or reason to how they're doing it, the chances are your, your data situation is not going to improve very rapidly or, or very much at all. Um, my definition of data stewardship is, and I say this all the time, potentially everybody in the organization is a steward of the data. Because if they have a relationship to the data as a definer, producer, or user of the data, and they're being held formally accountable for what they do with the data, they're a steward of the data. It's not something that people opt into or opt out to, uh, opt out of. It's not something that you're going to assign people to be stewards. Most often, you're going to recognize people for what they do and recognize that they're data stewards, hoping that at some point they recognize themselves as data stewards and take to take the responsibilities that come along with being a data steward very seriously. And then I also share definitions of metadata, metadata governance, what metadata stewards are. You know, the same things apply to data governance as applied to metadata and metadata governance. I always say the data will not govern itself the metadata will not magically govern itself either. So metadata, that information about their, your data that improves the business and technical understanding, you know, it needs to be governed as well. Somebody needs to be responsible for it. People need to be held accountable for the metadata in order for it to be governed properly. So, okay, so I spent a little bit of time going through the definitions. I wanna jump right into the best practices because I can tell you, and I'm probably gonna repeat this a couple of times, that you know, when I do best practice assessments with clients, and I do quite a, quite a few of those every year, um, one of the first steps is to define a series of best practices to assess the organization against. And the number one best practice, 100% of the time, it's not even 98% of the time, has to do with senior leadership, supporting, sponsoring, and understanding 
what the heck data governance is and what it's going to take for your organization to be successful. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the best practice assessment, share with you what I have experienced as being industry best practices, talk a little bit about how to select the right best practices for your organization, because the same best practices can't be used for every organization in, in exactly the same way. And then we'll talk about, again, the importance of that very first best practice. And then I'll share with you some recommendations that typically go along with a best practice assessment. But you'll see I'll tie this very quickly into the importance of gaining leadership support for data governance. So I always suggest to organizations that, especially the ones that are just getting started, that they start by doing an assessment. And, and the way I, I talk about it quite a bit, and say, instead of taking a, a ready fire aim approach, I always suggest take a ready aim fire approach. And that means, you know, let's define some target behavior, some target activity that we want to be able to achieve, and let's strive for that. So let's start by defining some best practices. Let's select them from industry best practice or, you know, determine what's our appropriate criteria to determine what is best practice for standing up data governance within our organization. And then per each best practice, let's think about what are we doing presently? Again, trying to stay as non-invasive as possible. What are we presently doing that we can leverage and where is there opportunity for us to improve within the organization? So doing an assessment, you know, first of all, it's really important to select appropriate best practices for your organization. And then, you know, asking the appropriate questions and, and seeing what already exists and trying to stay as least invasive as we can in changing things within the organization, look to see what can be leveraged first, and then look for where there's opportunity to improve the organization. So <clears throat> I wanted to share with you what I have experienced as being really the top five best practices the ones that are probably selected most often or some variation on these for the organizations that I do assessments with. And you can see the very top, the, the one at the top of the list has to do with senior leadership support, sponsorship and understanding. And so I use two criteria to determine if something is best practice when doing an assessment. Number one, it has to be practical and doable for the organization. The, the second criteria is even more important the program will be at risk if we don't achieve what we've defined as being best practice for our organization. So the first question to you would be, is it practical and doable that you can get your senior leadership to not only support and sponsor, because those are, are relatively easy. Those come can people can provide lip service to, but really get them to understand what the heck data governance is and, and what it's going to take to be successful. So are you going to be at risk if senior leadership doesn't support, sponsor, and understand your program? I would say, again, 100% of my clients use that as the number one best practice, and they know that they need to focus some of the actions of their program on getting management, who, who we already alluded to the fact that they care mostly about the problems that you're solving, recognizing that, that those problems aren't going to be solved without having a formal governance program or without having some resolute effort to govern data within your organization. Okay, the second best practice is that resources are allocated to administer the program in, in, as an, on an ongoing basis. Again, you're not gonna have somebody run a program for six months and then it run itself. Typically, that's gonna be a best practice. Having policy guidelines, frameworks, that's an important best practice. It, is it practical and doable? Yes. Are you gonna be at risk if you don't have these things defined? most likely it'll, it'll present some level of risk if you don't have significant guidelines or framework or standards for your program. Same thing with goal, scope, expectation, roles, measures, you know, and data being governed consistently. This is not a uh, webinar. We have done many webinars or at least several over the years focusing on doing a best practice assessment. Really the point of this slide is to highlight that very first best practice, which is senior leadership support, sponsor, and understand because Without that, you might not even have the opportunity to move forward with data governance within your organization. So what are some of the things that you can do to select the, the appropriate best practices for your organization? I'm not going to tell you to use the five that I just shared on the previous slide, although they might work in some 
way, shape, or form for your organization, um, I suggest researching and doing discovery on industry best practice. There are more and more tools out there today to get lists of what other organizations have thought of as, as being best practice. So consider best practice that has worked for others. I do that a lot in my practice is look at the best practices that have worked for other organizations and share those with, with new clients to see maybe these will work for you as well. Customize your best practices. My suggestion is with your best practices, when you word them, stay in the present tense. Don't say, as our best practice, we will do this. No, that's not a best practice. A best practice is something that is taking place right now. So I suggest when you write your or script your best practices, you stay in the present and provide context for any unfamiliar words that you include in your best practices. I like to, as a best practice, with my best practices, underline the words that need to be described, need to be explained, and then I provide some context for them or provide their definitions within the, the appendix. Um, I want to, again, stress the importance of that number one best practice. And, and again, if I told you that it was 98% of the time that organizations use this as a best practice, at least in my, in my practice, um, it is 100% of the time. Um, and so senior leadership support and sponsorship is, is easy is easy enough for people to achieve, but to get them to understand what it's going to take to be successful, I'm always surprised when organizations tell me, oh yeah, we've got senior leadership support, sponsorship, and understanding, but yet we don't have a data governance program. Well, then how do they truly understand what it's going to take to govern data if that activity isn't taking place yet within the organization? Again, I like to use this as a best practice. Again, it's also strengthening the case to gain leadership support for data governance. Um, if you're just getting started, like I said, how could they understand what the program is going to look like? Focus on some on focus some of the actions that are a result of your governance program on gaining on, on continuing to gain support, sponsorship, and understanding of your data governance program. Oftentimes when organizations put to do best practice assessments, well, I would say all the time when they do the assessments, they culminate in a series of recommended actions. And again, these are just a series of, of, of typical types of recommendations that come out of an assessment. Again, I would suggest to do an assessment for your organization to make certain that these align with what your organization needs. But oftentimes the, the recommendations, the ones that are specifically focused on gaining leadership support are deploying your chief data officer or your chief data office or your officer and your lead, whoever's responsible for the program to find and implement an operating model of roles and responsibilities. I've written a lot in TDAN. We've done webinars on what looks like a valid operating model of roles and responsibilities around data governance, defining, define and execute a communication plan. We've done webinars on all of these things, I believe, defining and delivering program metrics, policy guidelines and standards. Those are all typical recommendations, especially for organizations that are just getting started, recommendations for how to get, what are the, the next actions that you need to take as you're deploying your program. There are other recommendations that aren't as associated with leadership support, and that would be incrementally initiate and deploy your program via use cases, you're not going to snap your fingers or flip a light switch and have governance come on for your organization. You want to start and do this incrementally. So you're going to do it through via use cases. And as I'm sure Matt would agree to, and, and all the catalog and tool vendors would agree to, we need to deploy a data documentation platform, some way to give people to raise their levels of confidence and understanding in the data. So let's spend the next section of this webinar talking about defining what leadership needs from data governance. So if what we're trying to do is gain leadership support for data governance, I tried to limit it. it there ended, this ended up, could have been a much larger section of this webinar, but I wanna kind of boil it down to five topics. So when it comes down to defining what leadership needs from your data governance program, well, they need help with their de devising a clear data strategy. And I'll talk about that a little bit. They need help with improving the quality and the accuracy and the confidence that people have in data. There's certain, one of the things that's a no brainer 
one of the reasons why I feel confident using the execution and enforcement of authority as my definition of data governance is compliance and risk management is huge when it comes to what leadership needs from data governance. Accessibility and availability, every organization I talk to, people complain about data is not accessible to them. It's not available to them or they don't know what data exists. And then data-driven data insights. These are the things that, at least from my experience, leadership is looking for from data governance. And if you have other ideas, be like the, the data diversity community is and use the chat session section in this in this webinar and list some other things that they, that your leadership needs from data governance. But maybe you want to wait until I talk about these five things first before you start adding to them. So the first one is they need clear vision and strategy. They need a clear data strategy. Um, whether it's coming from your chief data office or your chief data officer or your head data person, whether that would be a person who would be a data and analytics officer or just a, a senior VP responsible for data, oftentimes they're looking to include, to, to build out a data strategy. We just did a webinar recently where we talked about data governance's role in a data strategy. So you need to clearly articulate those things because leadership needs to have some sense of direction. They need to have the information they need to sponsor and to support everything that you're doing. They need things in terms of a framework for what governance and what the execution and enforcement of authority looks like within the organization, the formalization of accountability, the culture and the literacy. All of these things really go into, from a, a data strategy perspective, those things that your leadership are looking for from your data governance program. And I'm sure there's other things that we could add to this under clear data strategy, but you know, without having, uh, without having a clear data strategy, oftentimes there's not a data governance committee. I know in the program that I work with, uh, in the, uh, the university program that I work with, as they're talking about building out a data strategy, one of the first things that they focus on is establishing that data governance committee or that level of senior leadership knowledge so that they can support, sponsor, and understand data governance. Continuous improvement, collaboration, and communications. This is really big as to what leadership needs from data governance. So let's talk about another piece of it, quality and accuracy of data. Without having a data governance program or a data management program or some cooperative between a data governance program and a data management program, the quality and the accuracy of data within the organization is not going to resolve itself. So somebody need, and, and it's very difficult to define quality, quality data. What is quality data in your organization if you do not have quality standards defined? So in order to know what's right and what's wrong, we got to start with what's right. And that is oftentimes is defined within the quality standards. We need validation and verification. That's what leadership wants. They expect, they expect that data on their dashboards has been validated and verified, that there's data cleansing and enriching, there's data quality metrics. Again, I could spend almost the whole day just talking about how leadership needs quality and accuracy and all these different subjects associated with the management of the data, the governance of data. And how is it going to get done unless somebody has the responsibility for it? So when you're gaining leadership support for data governance, if you don't have a clear differentiation between what data governance and data management is, you might want to even start there. I know I'm working with an organization now that has an established Office of, of Data Management, and they're establishing a data governance program, and there's some confusion over who has responsibility for what. Well, defining what leadership needs from governance has to do with quality and accuracy, and quality and accuracy a lot of the time has to do with the activities, the, the behavioral activities of data governance and the operational activities of data management is required in order to achieve data quality standards, validation, all of these things that are listed on the screen. All right, compliance and risk management. I talked real quickly about that at the beginning of this section is that this is the gimme, this is the no brainer. This is the one that the government's not coming to us with compliance rules 
with risk management rules. Our, our industries aren't coming to us and saying, here are the rules, follow them if you'd like. They're saying, here's the rules, you need to follow them. And if they haven't yet, you're gonna to need to be able to demonstrate in an auditable fashion that you're following the rules that are being defined. So where is governance going to, where defining how leadership needs data governance? Somebody needs to be making certain that all of these things around compliance and risk management are being documented. So the regulatory compliance framework, the data classification and handling policies. I've worked with a lot of organizations where the protection of sensitive information is the key driver of their data governance program. And so classification and handling, those rules are oftentimes defined the behavioral aspect of that comes from data governance. How do we educate people on what data is classified in what ways and what are the appropriate handling rules associated with that data? So again, things that leadership are looking for from governance, if it's not from governance itself, it's gonna be some from some combination of data governance and the data management function within your organization. All right, I got to move a little bit quicker because I got a bunch of slides still to go through. So accessibility and availability, the biggest complaint that I hear from organizations is access to data. And people are used to having great access to data at prior roles that they played within other organizations and they don't understand why is it so limited within the organization that I'm working with. Well, oftentimes the cultures are different. And so the inventory, the access policies are different, the availability, the reliability, all these things, access and availability is another key factor for what, what leadership needs from your data governance program. And data-driven insights, that's the, that's the last one of the things that I, the five that I listed. And that is, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing leadership change from being chief data officers to chief data and analytics officers, because somebody needs to drive data-driven insights. So that includes having a data strategy, quality, integrity, data integration, all of these things. So I listed five main subjects, but under each of those subjects, I listed at least eight bullets, <coughs> excuse me, of points that, that align with each of those needs that leadership has from data governance. Again, they could be data governance functions, <coughs> They could be data leadership or they could be data management function. <clears throat> so one of the things that I suggest to organizations is that they go out early on as, as part of the assessment as well that I spoke about earlier, <clears throat> that they record what are some of the data challenges are that people are having within the organization. And I wanted to share with you several ways that you can do that because one of the ways that you're gonna get leadership to support data governance, they're not gonna support data governance because you tell them it's important. They're gonna support data governance because you have proof from people within the organization that they are dealing with data challenges that will not write themselves, that will not correct themselves. So I wanna share with you some techniques for how do we go about recording those business data challenges. And one way might be through data audits and through interviews and issue tracking. So just quickly wanna run through these items, um, just some ideas around a data audit. You know, Identify data quality issues, highlight the, the, the governance gaps that are taking place within your organization. You, know, you can use the audit of your environment to uncover data security vulnerabilities. So there are, through use of audit, it seems a little bit more invasive than non-invasive, but, but through, through audit, you can certainly capture what some of your quality issues are, what your governance gaps are, security issues, you know, assessment, you know, your storage and retention practices. So conducting a data audit is certainly one way to start to quantify and to articulate what some of your, your business data challenges are. And again, going back to what Matt mentioned earlier, you know, management really cares about the problems that you're solving. I'm going to go back a slide here real quick if I can. So that, you know, what are, what problems are you solving? What data quality issues are you solving? What data governance gaps are you filling? What security vulnerabilities are you identifying? Being able to tie data governance to those types of things are going to, and, and not just bringing them to them and saying, hey, we see these things, but letting people know that these are, are true life examples of challenges people are having goes a long way towards convincing or gaining leadership support for governance. Then there's stakeholder interviews and surveys. 
especially when you're doing a data governance assessment like the assessment I talked about earlier, one of the ways we start out that meeting is by what, what challenges are you facing? What are the quality issues, the usability issues, the accessibility issues, and those types of things? How are we tracking issues? Do we have centralized documentation? Is there a central way for people to be able to report quality and data issues to your organization? Certainly using that issue tracking is another way to be able to record what some of your business data challenges are. And then through the council meetings themselves, through pulling together the strategic people within the organization, if you can get them to gather information about challenges that people who work for them are having with the data, they can bring them together, they can bring them to light at your data governance council meetings. So having just you know discussion around it, identification of data challenges through those meetings, through getting these people together and having them collaborate and share knowledge, all of these different ways are, are just another way of being able to record business challenges that ultimately now you're gonna to wanna to use to convince your, or to gain senior leadership support for, um, for data governance. And the last time one is data analytics and monitoring. So are there ways that you can use technology to do some of those monitoring, to, to identify what some of those challenges are, even proactively before somebody has, has reported them as being issues? using real-time anomaly detection, profiling, those types of things. Again, don't want to read through the list, but there are lots of ways to record challenges. One of the ways that I use most successfully within assessments is I just talk to people. I present to them a list of potential challenges and then let them open up and, and share what types of challenges they're having within the organization. And typically in those assessment meetings, there's two questions that I ask. One question, well, there's several questions that I ask, but two questions that are really important. And these are questions that can be asked of, of basically anybody within the organization. And the results of the questions basically can be presented to your senior leadership and help them know that all of these challenges that people are presenting to you, that they're not going to address themselves. So let me share with you those, those magical two questions. Really, there's a third question as well. And if you ask people in the organization what they can't do, that they need to do, because they don't either have the data to do it, or they don't have the understanding or the confidence in the data to, be, to do it, that's opening a spigot to give them, for them to tell you what are some of the things that they can't do, that the data, what problems are the data causing for them? Now, the flip side of that question is, what could you do or what would you want to be able to do if you had data and you had the confidence in the data to do it? So that's like I hear predictive modeling. I'd like to be able to slice and dice the data this way, but I don't have the data to be able to get the results that I need without a lot of data wrangling. Now, when you ask these two questions, what can't you do and what could you do or what would you do? it actually presents a, a big opportunity for people to share what types of data challenges that they're having. And then there is a third question that goes with those top two questions. And that is, what do these answers to these questions of what people can't do and what they'd like to be able to do? What do they have to do with data governance? Now we get to a point where we need to be able to demonstrate again, the value of, of, of data governance so we can gain support but if it's not addressing things that are real for people within the organization, and I think that was one of the things Matt talked about at the beginning of the session, um, then it's, it's going to have a very, people are going to have a very hard time seeing the value that comes from governance. So I'm going to share quickly a couple of the ways that you can use these challenges to gain support, quantify the impact of all the different challenges that people are sharing with you, align with the business objectives, link it to risk management, because that's one of the things that keeps leadership up at night, make certain that they understand that the risk isn't going to manage itself. The behavioral aspect of risk management is very closely tied to data governance. In fact, data governance and information security or your risk management function should be close partners in your governance program present cost benefit scenarios, provide actionable recommendations. Let's walk through some of these, you know, provide data quality metrics, show to the organization that your governance program is reducing the number of data related incidents within the organization. I know a lot of organizations are looking to tie 
in fact, I had a conversation even earlier today of tying data governance to return on investment. What type of return, return on investment are we going to get specifically from data governance? Oftentimes, even if you start down the path of trying to see where data governance is making money for your organization, the conversation seems to turn towards cost savings. How is it going to save us money? So if, we, if quantifying the impact can come from improved value that comes from the data, that's great. If you're increasing revenue from data, that's fantastic. A lot of times, at least early on, we need to connect the, the impact of data governance to cost savings. How much time is it taking for people to get to data? How long are people waiting to get their, their requests fulfilled? Um, improving decision-making, stakeholder satisfaction. These are other ways to be able to quantify the impact of your challenges. Align them with business objectives. See how the challenges are associated with those things that you're measuring as part of your KPIs, your business impact analysis. You know, I talked a little bit about return on investment. In many organizations, they are looking for return on investment from other investments, not necessarily investments in data governance, because data governance itself does not, it costs mostly people's time. So you're not making a huge investment other than people's time, typically when you're implementing a behavioral data governance program. So looking for return on investment from other investments within the organization. For example, you're creating an analytical platform or a data warehouse. Recognize that the return on investment from that warehouse or from that analytical platform will not be as great if the data is not trusted, if the people are not confident in the data. So look for a return on investment elsewhere um, through um, business profits efficiency, um, through data-driven insights. These are additional ways of taking those challenges and being able to get them to align with business objectives. Through links to risk management, I talked about that quite a bit through risk mitigation, through regulatory compliance, through security incidents. Again, we're looking for ways to use the things that people have shared with us in the techniques that we just talked about in gaining an understanding of their business challenges. How do we link that to risk management and that, and how do we link risk management to what leadership is going to understand so that they can truly support our data governance program. So through risk mitigation, regulatory compliance, through the reduction of the data security incidents, through business continuity and resilience, all of these things are ways to be able to link your challenges to risk management within your organization. Through cost reduction, I talked about that a little bit before. Um, we're, we're not really looking for ROI from data governance itself. We're looking for how are we improving the efficiency and the effectiveness of people in terms of how they are governing and how they are managing data. Again, looking for return on investment from where the heavy dollar investments are being made within your organization and recognizing that the return from those investments are not going to be as significant if the data is not of high quality and if, it's, if people are not confident in that data. So again, just find um, cost benefit scenarios, be able to articulate what is the, 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 the lack, the, the amount of time that it's taking for people to get reports, what is that costing our organization? How is the delay in information or even the lack of information preventing us from making decisions? A lot of that goes into different cost benefit scenarios. Where are people in the organization not governing the data effectively we need to focus our governance program on getting people to enter the data in a timely manner, enter effective and accurate data, and get that data in the hands of the people that can use that data to make decisions. Provide actionable recommendations. Again, I, I talked about some of the re recommendations that typically come out of a data governance best practice assessment. Some of those things are, are really required. In fact, the, the top five recommendations that I shared with you were all related to gaining senior leadership support. That is having somebody to run the program, communicating effectively with those people, you know, basically all the things that, that need to be done in terms of recommendations that come out of an assessment, um, provide recommendations around improving quality, risk management, efficiency gains, and, and those types of things. So the one thing that I suggest is, is take, your lead, take your governance program and make the actions of your program um, more actionable to your organization. 
So the last subject I want to talk about today is, is using policy and strategy to gain leadership support. So I am not necessarily a person that will tell every organization that they need a data governance policy, but let's talk about what would go into a data governance policy and whether one would be necessary in your organization. One of the things that I have seen is that one of the things that a data governance policy does is, first of all, it has to be signed off at the highest level of the organization. So people in your executive role, people in your leadership roles, they're not going to sign a data governance policy that they don't understand. So just creating a data governance policy so that it is a tool and a mechanism for them to get a better understanding of what your governance program look, looks like, that is a big value that comes from developing a data governance policy. Aligning with business objectives, establishing a governance framework. Let's walk through each of these before I turn it back to Shannon to see if we have any questions today. So really, these are the five actionable steps, or at least the things that I hope you can take away from this webinar as things that you can do to gain leadership support for data governance. So one of those things might be to establish a data governance policy within your organization, or at least use an existing policy or, or a, a standard for policies within your organization and create a document that says, these are the objectives, these are the scope, of what our governance program are, is going to achieve. Senior leadership is not going to support your program if they don't understand what the objective is and what, what's in scope. Because it can be structured data, it can be unstructured data, it can be internal data, it can be external data, it can be all data, but you're not going to govern all your data at once. So establishing the objectives and the scope is important. Identifying who the stakeholders are. These are things that are, uh, should be included within a policy. And, and understanding what it's going to take to obtain their buy-in for why a formal data governance program is necessary. Conduct a data assessment. We talked about it a little bit earlier where you can start with your assessments and then see what are we doing that supports these um, best practices and where is there opportunity to improve? And then start to define out the, the recommendations and the actions your organization will take. Define roles and responsibilities. Develop the different policy components. I, I lumped this all under the develop a data governance policy action step to gain leadership support. Align the policy that we just talked about with the business objectives. So that means that we need to make certain that we have clearly defined business objectives or we know where to go to find them, you know, perform a gap analysis to find alignment objectives, do all the things that you need to do to take that policy to align it with business objectives. Think logically, if we're trying to gain leadership support, our policy needs to line, align with those things that are most important at that level of the organization. Establish a data governance framework. We've talked a lot about that in previous webinars about, about standing up a framework so that you're looking at all of the core components of a data governance program and you're looking at them from each of the different perspectives of the organization. From the executive, strategic, tactical, operational support perspectives, we need to know what their role is. We need to know how to communicate with them. We need to know what their processes are that are important to them and the tools that they use. You know, establishing a data governance framework is an excellent first step for either taking a look at your existing program and see what you're missing, or if you're just getting started with your program, recognize that we need to fill in all the different blocks of a data governance framework. Just to let you know, in the, the, the second non-invasive data governance book, I introduce a data governance framework you might want to go take a look at. Um, what are some other things? Communicate risk and benefits. You know, understand who the audience is of your policy and your strategy. Define your key messages. Provide concrete examples, not industry made up examples, but find examples within your environment that are going to resonate with people within your organization. You know, use visual aids, address concerns and questions, um, establish metrics. It's always good to know, and you're going to get the question as to what is the program done for you. So if you can align it with business objectives, and then you can demonstrate uh, measurable results associated with those business objectives, it's going to help to continue to gain senior leadership support and maintain the level of senior leadership support that you need in order for your program to be effective. And so in this webinar, I shared with you um, we, we started by talking about the best of the best practices. 
defining what leadership needs from governance. We talked about some techniques to record what the challenges are that people in your business are, are having, using those challenges to gain support. And finally, we, we talked about using policy and strategy to gain leadership support. And with that, Shannon, I am going to turn it back over to you to see if we have any questions. Lots of questions coming in, Bob. Thank you for another great presentation. And Matt, we invite you to join back in the Q&A and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording, along with anything else, including questions we didn't have time to get to for this webinar. We'll get those answers to you in the follow-up email. So diving in here. So we have a CDO who is responsible for technical architecture and data foundation. So data strategy is related to that technical aspect and data governance officer is responsible for data governance, data quality, metadata issue governance, et cetera. So data governance strategy is different. How can we resolve data management versus data governance difference? <laughs> wow, didn't we just do a webinar on that, Shannon? I swear we just talked about that. Um, similar, yeah. yeah, actually the, um, I, I, Put it, I look at it very simply, at least I try to look at it very simply. And Matt, I'd be curious to hear your comments on this as well. The data management is more of the operational, in some ways, the, the techno, technical view of the data. So a lot of the things that the person who asked that question mentioned fell under that category, fell under data management. Data governance is more focused on the, the behavioral and the people aspect of getting the right people to do the right thing at the right time, to give them the right understanding of that data. In my opinion, and the way that I actually see it taught within the university is that the data strategy has to include all of those things. In fact, it has to be the, the glue that pulls those things together. So I would say if I'm, if I'm answering your question the way that it was asked, um, the data strategy needs to include both your data manage, both your your construct and and you know what data management looks like, but it has to demonstrate what data governance looks like too. And it is a prime place to be able to talk about how those activities are going to collaborate, coordinate, work together, basically. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty accurate. I mean, the way we explain it is for those of you who follow American football, think of the governance as the offensive coordinator, the person who's going to put the game plan in place, going to call the plays, going to say, this is how we are going to try to move the football down the field. Data management is actually the players on the field doing the execution. And so both of them work in tandem and the the data, the data governance group has to take into account the capabilities of the management group. What can they do? What can't they do? What do they do well? Well, what do they need improvement on? And so it's those two. And I think Bob made a very good point. The data overall data strategy combines those two groups: the governance and the management. I like your analogy. Somehow I knew the analogy was going to come back to sports. <laughs> it, it, it's funny sports though. It, it, <laughs> those are the ones that resonate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, we got time for a couple more here. So is data risk management part of data governance function? And is risk management a separate function within the organization? Wow. Matt, do you want to address that first? Yes. Go ahead. It is. It, it simply is. You know, what data, especially as we're going to more seeing self-service analytics, um, data risk management, making sure that groups don't get access to data they're not supposed to, whether that's separation of duty or other IP getting, getting out. Risk management is a part of the governance function. We're seeing that in more and more groups becoming that way. And then I'm going to answer the question from a consulting perspective, and I'm going to say it depends. I'm going to say that the the day to day operationalization of risk management is going to be more of a data management function, and the behavioral aspect in getting the people to do the right thing in terms of risk management is going to be more of a governing function. So I, I think I'm agreeing with you, but then with a, a caveat that that yeah, it, it it's not. 
oftentimes there is a separate risk management group within the organization, maybe even data risk management group. It may come under a different name within your organization, but oftentimes they're the ones that are responsible for defining the rules. Oftentimes data governance has the responsibility for making certain that the rules are known and that they're being executed and enforced properly. I love it. All right, so we've got six minutes left. I think we can, or five minutes left, we can add one more question here at least. Um, so Bobby, uh, so you seem to uh, like fine wine better and better with age. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> many organizations have employees that have been there for many years and just want to stay, stay in their lane. Have you ever encountered that? And how do you address that with them um, with the data governance program? Well, you know, at some point it, it becomes less, um, you know, it, it, it's not the new thing anymore. So it's not as though, and something else potentially will come and grab the attention from people. So even though you're, you want to just stay in your lane, I mean, I think if you're in a good lane and you're able to demonstrate the value and the success of your program, again, getting back to the measuring of the program itself, if you're able to measure and report that value, then there's not really a problem with staying in your same lane. But as we know, with new things, like nobody was talking about generative AI in the, you know, two years ago, even a year ago. Now it's all people want to talk about at the conferences and those types of things. You know, mesh and fabric have come and they haven't gone. They're still here. But I mean, there's other shiny objects that are going to take their attention. We need to, the communication with your senior leadership isn't something that should be one and done. It has to be ongoing. And so the gaining leadership support for data governance, yeah, it's really important when you're getting started but it never ceases to exist. You need to continue to gain leadership support because who knows, you may decide that you want to acquire a data catalog or you may decide that you want to hire a couple of business analysts or somebody to work for your data governance office. You know, that's going to require some additional support of your leadership. So it's not a one and done. It's something that sustains. So even if you're in your own lane, don't put it on autopilot because in autopilot, you know, you, you're going to be, it's going to be a lot more risky than if you have control. It's a good analogy though. Hmm. All right. Anything that you want to add there, Matt? No, I think he did a wonderful job answering that question. <laughs> Love it. So um, do you get the alignment when organizations are saying, data governance and data management are more of an IT rather than an enterprise responsibility? Boy, that sounds like another webinar for another yeah. day. <laughs> um, you know, if somebody asks me where data governance should reside in, in IT or in business, I answer the question, yes. It has to reside somewhere. There are some people that will tell you if your data governance program resides in IT, in IT, it's going to fail. I am not one of those people. I have seen many successful programs. Now, if you're if you're if it's a program in IT that's being run up by IT for IT's sake, then yes, it's going to have a, it's going to have a, a difficult time. If it's a program run that resides in IT that engages business stewards, you should just be you should be able to be just as successful as if it resides in the business. That's my thought. Matt, any thoughts on that? We're starting to see because I think we're getting out of uh, once I'll use one of your words. It depends. If the IT group is like, you know, I'm going to date myself the early mid 90s where they felt they were the gatekeepers for the organization because the business couldn't couldn't be trusted. Then no, you're going to have trouble. If because now business groups are becoming much more tech savvy. They're able to understand some of the technical limitations and new IT groups then I, that understand that it's more of a partnership with the business, then it can be successful residing there. Yeah, I really think it all depends on the organization. And there's not a, is if somebody knows the silver bullet answer that will work for everybody, please let that, let us know. 
because I think there's a lot of people that want to know, well, you know, is there a, an answer to that question? I think it depends. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Well, that does bring us right to the top of the hour. Thank you both for these great presentations and the answers to this, these questions. And keep your questions coming for any questions that we didn't have time to get to. There's so many great ones. We could, As Bob mentioned, we could probably have webinars on a lot of these questions and, and have on a couple of them. Um, keep them submitted and we'll get those, I'll get those over to Bob and we'll get those answers included in the follow-up email, which goes out by end of day Monday, also including links to the slides and links to the recording. So Bob, thank you so much. Thanks to Precisely for sponsoring today's webinar and helping make these webinars happen. Matt, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely, glad I could do it. Thanks, thanks, thanks y'all. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.